Hello, we're the Koshans, and we're really grateful to be here with you today. We're going to sing a song called Revelation Song that Maddie's going to lead us in, and we invite you to join us in it. Mike LeClaire and I'm the pastor of Living Hope Church and I'd like to welcome you once again to our virtual weekly service. Uh, before I get into the message today I'd like to give out some thank yous. First and foremost uh, I want to thank you Pastor James for the countless hours that you have put in making sure this all works well. Um, the countless hours you put in making sure all the different groups and ministries in this church stay connected during this time. You are incredibly valuable, and we so appreciate the work that you have done. I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank Pam and Greg Tice for their labor and their work that they put in that's gone beyond the call of their duty to uh, make sure that the technology and the website are maintained and continuing on so that people have a place to go to get help and to give help. I thank you for that. I thank you guys a ton for that. I also want to thank uh, Bill Varney. Mike Waldrop, and Pastor Tim Mandich for uh, being willing to go in and do deep teachings on this very chapter that we're talking about today because this message cannot be preached in a 20-minute span of time. But what you, what you have done is you've broken it down into three sections and they taught deeper. So if you want to hear a deeper teaching on the message I'm giving you, you can go to the website and you can see these teachings in a much deeper way. So I want to encourage you to do that. So let us get into the scripture today. In Mark 13, 1, I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 5 to begin. It says, Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another. 
that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things are fulfilled. And Jesus answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. Heavenly Father, we just ask right now that by the power of your spirit, that you would open our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to receive what you have for us this day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. On Good Friday, we talked about the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and then on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we talked about his ascension to the Father. In between his resurrection and his ascension, he spent 40 days, the Bible says, meeting up with various people, saw over 500 people at various times. There's 11 different accounts of that time between the resurrection and the ascension. So last week he ascends to the Father, and this week we are talking about his return. The blessed hope. We know that Jesus is coming back, and that is our hope. And this chapter speaks to the time of that. It gives us an idea, a season of that. And uh, well, we'll find out as we go through this teaching today. So first thing we deal with is we deal with this temple. Because it's a sign that Jesus is giving based on a question that was thrown at him. The temple has been attacked. King Solomon built the original temple for God. And that thing was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar 500 years prior to Christ. So the temple was destroyed at that time. And then we come to the prophet Ezra, and he is about the business of rebuilding it. And then about 169 years before Christ, the Maccabeans have to put on a defense because there's an, another attack on the temple. And today, Hanukkah is celebrated because of that defense that they put on to save the temple. And then in AD 70, the temple was destroyed by Rome. So the prophecies given, I just want to speak about prophecies for a second, are prophecies that affect us in the near and in the far. So when God gives a prophecy in the Old Testament, it has application for that day, but it has a greater fulfillment in the later day. And that's exactly the case here. There's a greater fulfillment, and it sets the timetable for Christ's return in many ways. So that's why we like to re refer back to the Old Testament prophets to get a fuller understanding. And he says in verse 3, and he says, Now he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign, of, and what will be fulfilled. So what will be the sign of these things, and what will be fulfilled? And Jesus' answer is so poignant. He says, He began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. Why? Because in this day, deception, from the time of Christ to this day today, deception has been the rule. The attack on the truth of the gospel has come from all different angles, all the ologies that we've talked about, all the different religions that spring up, all the people that professed and said that they were the king, they were the Messiah, they were the chosen one, they were the Christ. These things have happened throughout the last 2,000 years. And he says, be careful that you're not deceived. What's he saying? There is a truth. There is an absolute truth. And you cannot, and the only way to know that truth is to know Christ, who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. To know him is truth. How do we know him? We know him by his word. The Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is that word who dwells among us. To know him, how do we know him? We know him by, his, by reading his word. How else do we know him? We know him by prayer. As we talk to him and we listen to him, he reveals himself. To, he reveals to our spirit who he is. Prayer and the word are the two best ways to know him. And he's telling his disciples, do not be deceived by all these different things. I would say to you and to me today, 
Do not be deceived. Deception comes in many different ways. Deception comes in, in the church. In the church, there's deception. What's the deception? Making light of these this time period that I just spoke, at the very beginning spoke about. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The ascension of him to the Father. The many proofs that were given before that. And then his imminent return. These are the gospel. And to know that and not deviate in any kind of way. Light teaching. Teaching where I give you my opinion as opposed to what the word of God teaches is a deception. Don't listen to those. If I give you my opinion, I'm going to tell you it's my opinion. That's for me. It might help you. But don't take it as gospel. When I give you the word of God, that's the truth. And he's telling this to his disciples. For many will come in his name saying that I am he and deceive many. What happens during this deception? Deception feels like somebody was just fooled. Well, it's greater than that. Deception takes us to deep places far from God. I'm going I'm to say something that doesn't fit the world today because the world is teaching something different. But if I look at a person, if I look at a man, and I can see that genetically, his features, he's a man. And he says that he's a woman trapped in a man's body. That's a deception. That's of the level that I'm talking about. The reality of his manhood isn't there. That's the kind of deception. And that's the kind of deceptions that people believe today. And they do incredible things to change who they truly are. Because they have been deceived. We have been deceived in many ways today. So we have to stay close to the truth of God that we not fall far from that. Deception leads to delusions. It leads to lawlessness and it leads to rebellion. And if I look at our world today, that's what I see. And I can even see it in some churches. And I'm not here to rip on the church. Believe me, I love the church. But I see ebbing and flowing away from the truth of God to go to some other places that are a little bit easier to talk about. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. What are the latter times? Latter times are the days that we live in today. Everything that happened after Christ's ascension to the Father, or actually everything that happened since Christ came, is now the latter times. I think we're nearing the end of the latter times. This is my personal feeling, and I think I see the signs uh, that show us that. But it says, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypo hypocrisy, having their own consciences seared as with a hot iron. Okay, that's what happens in this day, and that's what we are to be careful of. The doctrines, we don't blame people. My heart wants to, uh, my, my flesh wants to blame people, but we know full well that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It is against rulers and powers and authorities in heavenly places, not angel angels, but demons. And it talks about very specifically doctrines of demons. And they are out to deceive us. Why? Their father, Satan, is a deceiver. In fact, his name means deceiver. So in verse 7 it says, But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. I'm going to just tart, speak from the time of Christ. From the time of Christ to this day, there have been multiple wars, rumors of wars, kingdom fighting against kingdom, and it's it's been going on forever. So why is that so pertinent? It's pertinent because it comes with uh, like birth pangs. It says in verse 8, it says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes in various places. These are the beginnings of of sorrows or the beginnings of birth pangs. So when we see these things happening, we know it with greater intensity and greater fer uh, fervency, just like we see in a woman who's giving birth or who is going through labor. They start out, the labor pains are evident and they're so far apart. As she moves closer, closer to giving birth, they become more frequent and more intense until she's ready to birth what she's going to birth. So in her case, it's going to be to birth a child. In this case, case things will lead, these times will lead to the birthing of the return of Christ. Okay? However, <laughs> they speak to his arrival in the air. It doesn't speak about so much what's going to happen after he comes. And I'll share with that in just a little bit. 
But he says in verse 9, he says, Watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you'll be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and before kings for my name's sake, for a testimony to them. When you go to share this truth that I'm sharing with you right now, as we move closer to the end of the age, as we move closer, the rebellion against the truth of God becomes greater. So you in the church, I spoke a little bit about this last week. When you want to share the love of Jesus Christ, you're not just speaking to a person. You're battling spiritual things coming at you to get a message across to somebody who God desperately loves, who he wants to be his. That brings about a warfare that comes against you. That's what's going to happen. And what happens in certain nations? You'll be beaten. You'll be flogged. You'll be killed. And that's happening in the world today for people that stand up for the truth of Christ. This isn't so much about the battle and fighting. This is about sharing the love of God that people could experience the blessed hope in their own lives and salvation would come to them. And it says in verse 10, it says, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So when we're talking about when's Jesus return, when's he coming back, the gospel will have been preached first to all nations. It's a big deal. Today, I believe that we have the capability to get the word out to the world. The technology is in place that everybody could hear the gospel. Third world countries are people running around with two cell phones in their hands. I've seen it. <laughs> what the heck? Uh, people are connected more than ever before technologically. So who knows how soon this will be? I think it's soon. First, Thess First Thessalonians 4.13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. So he's talking about when Jesus is coming to get his church. He says, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Then you have hope. Do you believe that he suffered, died, and buried, and rose again, and is coming back for you? If you believe that with all your heart, you have hope. Okay, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the end, the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So the dead in Christ basically is what they're talking about. The dead who love Jesus are going to be called up. All right, that's what he's talking about, those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So let me talk about this appearing for a second. This is not necessarily the return of Jesus to the earth. He is meeting us in the sky, somewhere between heaven and earth, all right? In the sky. And the Bible says that there'll be a trumpet blast from the angel. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive during that day will be caught up to meet together with them in the air. And we will take off to heaven. And I believe that we'll take off to the wedding supper of the Lamb up in heaven. It's a place you want to be. Because everyone else is left behind. Mark 13, 11 says, But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you'll speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. In other words, if I'm taken in and I am questioned, interrogated, and the Spirit of God prompts me to say something, He will speak through me. I will know what to say in that day. I've experienced that to some degree, just as a, as a pastor speaking God's word. What do I say? What do I say? Boom, it's, it comes out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me that to be able to speak. And he'll do even more so in this last day. Thank you, Jesus. What's going to happen in this day? Brother will betray brother to death even, and father to his children. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. This will be the spirit of the day. There will be no peace in this day. Why? 
because something happens in the spirit realm that takes away peace. And, and I get uh, rather excited about this, but there's a prophecy given in the book of Daniel, and we can't go into it now. It's way too much. But he speaks about the 70 weeks. There's 69 weeks have been fulfilled up to this point. There's a gap, and it's from the time of Christ to the time of his return. And at the time of his return is the beginning of that 70th week. And that 70th week is called the, the tribulation. And halfway through that is called the great tribulation. All right. And uh, when we know this return of Christ, and we know about this 70 week, we know about the tribulation that's going to come. This 70th week, we don't have to be a part of if we're in Christ. Because I believe Christ calls the church up before we get to this 70th week or this great tribulation time. But here's what's happening in heaven. And this is very powerful. So what's happening in the spirit realm? In Revelation chapter 6, it talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Some of you have heard about that before. But basically, these are spiritual occurrences <coughs> excuse me, in the heavenly realm that have implication on the natural realm, the physical earth. So there's the white horse. There's four horses. There's a white horse. is a conqueror. He has a bow without arrows, the picture says. But he's out to conquer and make war. And then there's a red horse. And the red horse takes peace from the earth. And there's killing and bloodshed. Take a look at the world today. What happened from 30 years ago today where all of a sudden there's no peace. There's not peace in families. There's not peace in neighborhoods. There's not there's Peace is lacking. That's what the red horse does. And the riders on the red horse, have, anyway. Then there's the black horse. The black horse brings on poverty, famine, and inflation. And then the pale horse brings on hunger, death, and Hades. These are spiritual phenomena in the spirit realm that have impact on the world today. They're like angels released, demons released, to have these things occur. Sounds pretty spooky, doesn't it? And it says, unless the Lord had shortened these days, no flesh would be saved for the elect's sake. Whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he's over there, do not believe it. And I said this before, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect. Even the elect could be deceived. The elect are God's people. But take heed, see, I have told you all these things beforehand. This is not new. God spoke, Jesus talked about this all through his ministry. And the prophets of old have talked about this day. But what does it look like with the coming of the Son of Man? He says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. I can go to the old prophets. I can go to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Joel, Zephaniah, Amos. All point to this very moment in time. Wow. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. Here's what's happening. You and I are believers. At that trumpet blast, the dead in Christ rise first. And then we who are caught up together meet with them in the air. We do not experience any of this great tribulation, I believe. Who does? The people on the earth of the day. And there are things that will happen during that day that will go out and still preach the gospel. There'll be 144,000 Jews out preaching the gospel. There'll be two witnesses that God sends preaching the gospel, that all will hear the truth. And in that, people will come to Christ, and they will die a martyr's death. And then God gives us a parable. In verse 28, he says, Now the parable of the fig tree. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also know when you see these things happening that it is near, at the door. Well, they use the fig tree in scripture, a lot to represent Israel. And the fig tree speaks of a time. So when it's ready to give leaves, we know that summer is coming. Well, as he spoke about these different signs, we know that the end is coming. And that's what he's talking about in Mark. All this tribulation is, is at the door. I said before, it's like 
the beginning of birth pains or false pains today, but very quick. The four horsemen begin to influence their, the riders on the horsemen begin to influence their, themselves upon the earth and it has great effect and it comes and causes calamity. And if you go into Revelation, you start talking about what do they unfold? They unfold judgments on the earth. Why? Because people have not come to Christ. And the bottom line is, judgment comes to those who do not have Christ. The bottom line is, if you do not know who Jesus is, you have no idea of making him Lord of your life. You've never made him the Lord. You've been the Lord of your life. He comes at you in judgment. If you have him in your life, he becomes your advocate. And he's up in heaven right now. Right now, he is in heaven, petitioning for you and me, believers, before the Father. But down here on earth, when he comes at this second coming, it is with a sword and 10,000 of his angels and saints, probably more than that, coming to bring judgment. Why does a loving God bring judgment? Because he is God. He is sovereign and he is holy. And a holy God cannot be a part of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Here, death happens as judgment. He saves us from that. But make no mistake, you have to be his. And the only way to be his is to ask him to be his. You want to be his. You want him to be yours. It looks something like this. Lord Jesus, be Lord of my life. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have problems and issues. I know that I need you. Be Lord, be God in me. Forgive me of my sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then when we stand before the Father, Jesus, our advocate, says he's mine. He's clean. He's us. He doesn't get judged. That's what I want for you. And I watch and I see the times and I see the urgency is greater than ever before. I left and retired from a career so I could do this, so I can speak this very message to those who I care about and love. It's not always received. That's okay. It's not okay for them. It's okay for me. But I have to give this message. And my hope and my prayer is that you receive it. That you become my brother. That you become my sister in Christ. That salvation comes to you. Because judgment does come. And this book is as much about judgment as it is about being saved. God's heart is to have you as his. But his, the reality of a holy God has to deal and judge like he said he would. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every person with an earshot of this message. I pray that they do go to the website to get the deeper understanding and teaching of something we've really scrunched in a short period of time. But I pray that they open their hearts and their minds. And right where they're sitting right now, that they would say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you. Come in. Change my heart. Change my life. Be my Lord. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.